morning's class is uh, just going to wrap up the first set of notes that you had. And then you'll, there's actually, what you'll start to see in the next few weeks is that there's a lot more notes than what you'll actually go through. And I will then be very selective on the slides that I, I cover. The other slides are there for your interest, right? Um, and if you, uh, and usually what the other slide will be is just additional examples of the same material for you to work through. So you'll, you'll often see me skip over over slides and then uh, just keep up with the number that's up here at the bottom corner. I'll point out that I'm moving over some, some additional material. So last class we ended up talking about this heat exchanger and and, and the, the context of last class was to look at the operating window for a process. And it's implicit that we want this operating window to be as large as we can make it. Right? So back to that example where we were looking yesterday at the human body, it's no good if we were only able to operate within very narrow temperature ranges and with very little food intake. So same idea with our processes, we want them to be capable of operating over as wide a range as possible. And then when we were looking at some of these examples yesterday, particularly this one of the heat exchanger, we said we want to be able to operate this heat exchanger when the cooling water coming in is really hot on a summer day at a low flow rate. Our fouling is really high on the heat exchanger, so this is after about two, three years of operation on this heat exchanger. This is fouling, fouling, fouling. We still want to be able to achieve the heat transfer so that we can obtain this lowest temperature. And despite the fact that this inlet uh, flow coming in is really high flow rate and high temperature. So what you see there is every time you add one of these additional requirements, this heat exchange is getting larger and larger and larger and, and the dollar figures are going up. So you may, might be concerned here that you're, you're thinking, well, all that we're doing is we're designing and essentially just over-designing. So, Let's just step back for a minute and, and recognize that absolutely we are over-designing, but what we're trying to do is design so that it's, it's as right as we can possibly get it for the conditions it's operating in. So when we look at equipment, uh, I've left this table filled in, so we won't go and fill it in interactively. Um, we can just, it's, so it's all very obvious stuff. It's small equipment obviously has the advantage of costing little money. Um, and we can usually operate that small equipment to get it very precise, so you can control it very, very carefully to get it to where you want. But of course, if a small piece of equipment doesn't have high capacity by its very nature, um, it cannot compensate for large changes and disturbances coming in. So there's some disadvantages. So larger equipment then, pretty much it's a mirror reflect, uh, the opposite of that. So higher capacities, we can compensate easily for large disturbances. We can usually achieve good transitions from one operating point to the other, but it costs us money, right? and at a cost of usually lower efficiency on, on the larger equipment. So, what you what we're aiming here for is just a, a balance, right? So you want we don't go say why not design construct equipment with very large capacities. So if you go look at um, at Petro Canada or a petroleum company. They don't go buy the largest distillation column possible. Right? And just put five of them up and say, well, we need this extra capacity. We're just going to buy it. Some groups were talking with me in the meeting, and they said, well, I'm going to buy a niche, and I'm just going to get the largest one I can possibly can, can buy and put it in there. Right? So we don't do that because it's going to cost us capital, obviously, and operating costs for that. But our aim is to get this balance between what we need from it's getting our operating window to be what we want it to be, so we can compensate for the disturbances that come through. So, for example, cooling water. We want to be able to handle high and low cooling water temperature. We want to be able to handle high and low flows. And very often when we do this design, there's an element of probability in it. So if you know that you want this equipment to operate, but there's only a day or two of the year where you get these excessive conditions, or combination of events occurring. So for example, if we go back to the heat exchanger, the combination of all these events, sorry, combination of all these events occurring simultaneously might be fairly low. Right? So then you may just simply accept the fact that you won't be able to get exactly this lowest temperature possible. However, if this temperature was a critical variable on your flow sheet. In other words, it's not just nice to have it low, you really do need it that low. Then you likely will go spend that extra money. The 
despite the very low probability of all these events occurring simultaneously. But very often, we as engineers have intuitive concept of certain variables on our flow sheet that are sort of, we like them low, but if they deviate, we can handle it. Or it's, we maybe produce off spec quality products at a secondary grade and not our primary grade. So you sell it for a little bit less money. Yeah. But would that 20% in the bare modules cost take into account that? Or no, we're, what we're talking about is you calculate the area first, then you go calculate the bare module cost and the 40% area gets thrown on afterwards. But your problem, what this problem is, is like what area do we just even need as our as our design for the heat exchanger? So the area we need needs to be an area that compensates for all these events occurring. So you wouldn't go buy this heat exchanger if all these events don't ever occur. But if, it, if this frequently occurs that you get high temperatures coming in with very low uh, cooling flow rates and the cooling water has a high temperature so you're operating in a hot climate, then absolutely you need to go buy the exchanger with that high area. But if the probability of all these events occurring simultaneously is low, then likely you're, you're just going to overspend. So my, my point is that when you come to design, don't just we don't just put in large factors and spend, 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 right? You're, we're just going to then create flow sheets that are, are large, costly, and as we saw here in this list of disadvantages of large equipment, larger equipment, we often cannot operate them very precisely, right? To think of like a big truck. You can steer a big truck, but it's fairly imprecise, whereas a small car you, or a bicycle, you can usually guide it and, and get it exactly where you want very carefully. Same thing with large equipment. The controls on large equipment are fairly imprecise. So we don't just go and put on large columns and equipment everywhere. I just also wanted to cover here in the rest of the slides an interesting point regarding operating windows is we, we like to expand our operating windows best we can. So if we look at a pump, a single pump operating, a single centrifugal pump operating will operate along the pump curve, which you've, you've seen a few times in this course and in prior courses, where you've got your flow rates over here, and then you've got your pressure or head delivered by the pump. And this curve will follow that sort of shape for a given impeller. So you can go by, say, a 10-inch impeller, will follow this curve. If you go change this impeller to an 8-inch impeller, you'll fall on a different curve. So we've, we've seen these sorts of things from a fluid flow course. And this curve is essentially the operating window for the pump. If you're on the 10-inch impeller, that pump can only operate along that line. Okay, it's a single line. It's not actually a two-dimensional space. You can only operate along that line. So if I, by that I mean is if I go put a valve over here, and I throttle that flow down to some lower flow rate, my pressure delivered by the pump gets higher. If I choose to operate at a higher flow rate, the delivery pressure on the pump is lower. So I, can, I have to move along that curve. Now, if we want a bit of, to expand that operating window, what we'll sometimes see on flow sheets, and this also ties into the next topic that we're going to look at, is to give us a little bit more flexibility in our process, we'll often tie in pumps in series. Okay, and what that does is it delivers the same flow through the pump, but now the pressure leaving there is, is a higher pressure coming in. And we put that same flow into the next pump, and we get an even higher pressure still. So two pumps in series allows you to expand your operating window to get the same flow, but at higher pressure. And if you don't need that higher pressure and you need just back to a single pump, you can always go back and operate just the single pump by putting a bypass around the second one. So you can get low, low, low pressure just by using one of the two, or you can get the higher pressure by operating both at the same time. So we'll, you'll often see this on certain flow sheets where you need to deliver a certain pressure um, at, a, at the same flow. Now if we go put two pumps in parallel, here, what, what's going to happen this time? Right. You can increase the flow without losing pressure. Increase the flow, 
without losing pressure. So each pump is going to deliver a certain pressure. That pressure gets combined over here and it's the same value. But you can now pump twice the amount of material through that circuit. So parallel pumps, two or three or more, more pumps in parallel will increase your flow rate capacity in your operating window at the same delivery pressure. So that's, um, the, that's, that's something you'll, you'll commonly see. Final point that I just wanted to mention, and this came up in a pre prior class when we were looking at PNIDs and the hazard and operability study, is where do you place your flow meters? Okay, so last time we had this discussion where we were talking about placing a flow meter, and the question was do we put it after the valve, as shown over here, or do we put it before the valve, or somewhere else? Recall that discussion we had a few classes back on hazard and operability study. And Jenna had asked the question, Progena had proposed to put the, valve, the, the flow meter after the valve. And I said, no, let's put it before because that, I just said you normally do it that way, but I never explained why. So the reason why is simply, um, typically these flow meters are orifice meters and they will create a pressure drop. So you put in some sort of constriction in the pipe and Across the constriction, you can you, we use Bernoulli's law and we use that to calculate the flow, but also that constriction creates an irreversible pressure loss for us. Okay. So the rule of thumb then is, and it's not a rule of thumb, based, but it's based actually on sound engineering, and I'll leave you to go through these slides and review Bernoulli's principle back from your fluid flow course. Uh, Dr. Marlin explains it over four or five slides over there. But the principle is, that if you place that, that orifice meter there in the pipe, you can partially vaporize the fluid and you read a poor flow. Furthermore, you cause an irreversible pressure loss. So the, the guidance is locate your flow meters upstream of your valve and locate them where the pressure is highest and the temperature the lowest. So that will, the temperature being the lowest will avoid flashing of any fluids at low temperature and put it where the pressure is the highest. Because you're going to induce some sort of pressure loss on there and you'd rather induce that pressure loss where you've got higher pressure rather than lower pressure. So you, you lose proportionally less pressure from that. So rule of thumb is locate your flow meters, FC here in this case, or if it was just an F, locate it on the piece of pipe, you can put it anywhere, like there's no splits and T junctions of this pipe. So measuring the flow here should theoretically give you the same flow as downstream. <coughs> However, taking Bernoulli's principle into account, put it in where your pressure is highest and temperature is lowest, and then control along your valve. Okay, so that's, uh, that explains more from a scientific point of view why we, why we do this. Okay, so I'll leave the rest of the slides over there for you to look at in your own time. And I'll move on to the new set of slides that I posted on the website yesterday, Topical Flexibility. So, if I say the word flexibility, what are some of the things you think about? What do you consider something that's flexible? And before you answer, consider what, what do you mean by something that's inflexible? Something that's adaptable to change. It's adaptable to change. So there's change and, it's a, and it can compensate or adapt for it. Okay. What else comes to mind when you think of Use the equipment for different processes. Okay, use it for a variety of purposes or processes. What do we need? So, yes, sir. A lack of constraints. Lack of constraints. Okay, so what we're aiming here is to remove any constraints from our equipment that might otherwise be, or in this case, uh, as Simon said, adjust or compensate for change. So you need to add or the equipment by itself is not going to adjust, right? We're not talking about people who can be flexible to you adjust yourself and, and compensate. But we're talking about equipment. So if we're in the context of equipment and process flow sheets, 
this is always going to be adding something to the process or modifying the PNID in some way to achieve flexibility. Now this topic is very intertwined with the previous one on the operating window. So if you think back on an operating window, you're plotting two variables and you may have an operating window that looks like that. Flexibility is the ability to move in this operating window and actually achieve all the bounds. Okay, so there's a no base case over there. Flexibility is adding the capacity to your equipment or to your flow sheet so that you can achieve this operating window in an easy manner. So let's, uh, let's take a look at some of, some of that. Um, so a process with no flexibility or an inflexible process is one that will not be able to achieve certain set point changes. So a set point change, for example, is if you require the composition leaving a distillation column to be higher or lower than it was previously, you've made a set point change. But by simply asking the process to achieve that new set point is not good enough. You need to have the process actually be capable of doing it. So what do we need to add to the process to make it if you think of a distillation column, what are some of the things we add to the column so that it, it can achieve different settings for the composition? Okay, so you how do you so you change your reflux ratio? But well, if you increase your reflux ratio, then it's going to recycle and get pure. Okay, so change your reflux ratio. Can you be a little bit more specific on how you actually implement that? So we're thinking of our flow sheets and our P and E diagrams. What do you change in your diagram to alter the reflux ratio? So you increase your pump flow or split ratio? Change the ratios? What? Yeah. So you need to add like control elements and sensors. Control elements, sensors, valves, so that you can alter the flows. Okay, so we need to, to add those things to our process to, to be able to respond to disturbances. We, we've considered disturbances in the previous class. We said these are things such as changes in the ambient temperature um, will, will be a disturbance. So our process needs to be adjustable or flexible to compensate for these changes around us. Another way of looking at it is we need to be able to steer the process. So we're adding the tools to our flow sheets so that we can manipulate and move our equipment to achieve different set points and to compensate for these disturbances. So what this comes down to, I'll, we can revisit the slide later on, but essentially the, the, key, the key way we achieve that is we always will add spare capacity with valves, heat exchangers, additional loaders, and so forth. We'll add additional equipment. We'll be able. We will add additional piping and, and valves, and we'll often see. We'll add bypasses as a way to achieve this flexibility. So that's going to be a new topic that you may have not seen before. Is adding a bypass around heat exchangers or around reactors is one of the key ways we achieve achieve that. So let's take a look at this example here. Um, again, in your project, many groups have a distillation column of some sort. And if we look at that column, we can define an operating point. An operating point is a given value for feed flow rate. So we know we're feeding a certain flow. We're, we're achieving a certain pressure at the top of the column. We're achieving a certain level, a certain distillate and bottom's composition. So that's my operating point where you'd like the process to be and we've got these disturbances coming in and changes in uncertainty and heat transfer efficiencies on the trays and so forth. Now, what happens if the cooling water temperature changes from 25 degrees in the summer to 10, 15 degrees in the winter time? So you're using cooling water up here in your condenser. Now, instead of sending 25 degrees water as the seasons change, fall, winter, this temperature starts to change to 10 degrees. Okay, is that a problem in the condenser? Are you looking at your reflux drum to increase that faster? You have to discharge more out to that upper street. Okay, so to avoid level overflow in here, you need to, to <coughs> discharge more. Is there anything we can change on that cooling water to 
or around over there to compensate for that change in the inlet temperature? Look at your flow rate or your resin sign in the cooling tower. Okay. So, well, in, in the winter time, we'll just the cooling tower will just deliver lower temperature to us. Mm -hmm. So we, we cannot alter that inlet temperature. Yeah. Is there something we can change? Can you can change the flow rate of cooling water so you do these less. Okay. Yeah, same thing. Okay, so we can alter the flow up here of our inlets to that condenser. So if you go through any one of these these five entities that define the operating point for a flow for a for a distillation column, every one of them needs to be controlled in some way. So if we're trying to control it in some way, we need to add on the equipment to do that and implement that control. So for example, for that cooling water, we need a valve up there to manipulate that cooling water flow. If we're trying to control the purity from the, from the vapor stream, we need to be able to control the reflux ratio. So we need to have a valve entering back into the column and the valve splitting off. Most people often think I just need a valve over here, either before or after the pump. <coughs> right? A single valve over there is not going to achieve purity control for you. You do need to control the ratio, which means you need two valves. So that flexibility comes through over there. Um, same thing here for the heat duty at the bottom, control that to control the bottom purity, the flow over there. And then here's an interesting one we'll you know, sometimes see on certain columns is that you have splitters so that you can choose where you feed, which tray you feed the, the column. Okay. So that's, um, that adds some additional flexibility to the process. If you decided after you've built the column that you need to feed at a lower tray, it's very costly to retrofit this. And so, Prior to building the column, if you can specify it to the supplier that you need three or four entry points at different trays, that's a whole lot easier to do before the column is built and delivered um, than to do it after the fact. And so you would determine the need for this based on your asthma simulations. Right? So you can use simulations to see what advantages and disadvantages you have from using different fee entry trays. And you will do that most commonly when this feed composition coming in is different. So your upstream feed is going to vary in composition. That's a disturbance. The composition enters over here. So if that's changing on you, you need to you pick a different tray to feed on so that you can still maintain top and bottom purity. Now, <laughs> many people kind of get frustrated with this course because there's just so many petroleum and, and petrochem type examples. Well, here's one from the bio, bio world to um, balance it a little bit. So take a look at this process. You've got a bioreactor, and bioreactors almost always operate in batch mode. There's a few continuous types, but this one is a batch type reactor. And on these bioreactors, the way that they are operated is that you will require to use or follow a certain trajectory. So the trajectory is being determined over here, for example, temperature. We'll start at some inlet temperature, ramp up for a period of time, and then ramp the temperature down after for a certain period. So it usually follows a recipe. And in this recipe, there's two stages. The first stage is the ramp up in temperature. The second stage is the ramp down. Now, during that change, that's temperature, but you'll also have similar trajectories for dissolved oxygen, another trajectory for pH that needs to be obeyed, uh, the trajectory for substrate concentration and substrate feed flow rate is another one that could be on here if it's semi-batch reactor. So all of those need to be followed. So that's my requirement to achieve the, the process that I'd like. Not everyone's in the bio area, so you won't always all understand some of those terminology, but those of you that are, you can list and add to that diagram the sorts of additional equipment you need to achieve that objective. Okay, so the solution of that is in the last slide of this note, so I won't go through it just yet, but to think about that, you won't get through, through to it today but you'll add, add to that flow sheet the necessary equipment you need to achieve that trajectory control. What sort of things should be added to that process? Okay. So, and then 
the final point before we get to some examples are on flexibility are this is probably something that's intuitive for you, but if you look at this flow sheet over here, uh, there's a number of sensors and a number of valves. The key point from this slide and the one after it is that for every control objective that you have in mind, so for example, I would like to control the level, that's one control objective. I would like to control this temperature coming into my flash drum, that's another control objective. The pressure over there is a third one. The level in the flash drum is the fourth variable I'd like to control. There may be several others that I can, can look at this flow sheet and, and think of. For every control objective that you have, you do need a degree of freedom to adjust for it. So it's an obvious thing, but people don't, uh, don't always appreciate it, that for every variable that you wish to control or achieve some sort of steady operation for, you need at least as many adjustable variables or more. So your number of valves typically is your adjustable variable. You need as more valves or as many valves as you have control objectives. And that just makes sense from how you, you pair them up. Okay, typically we'll have far more valves than we'll have control objectives. So let's take a look at, at a few examples then in this section. I'd like you to think back to your process control course, um, particularly at the end of 3P where you were considering multi-input, multi-output systems. Okay, so you remember those fairly complex diagrams, you've got two by two blocks and a lot of cross-linking between them and interaction between the blocks. One way you can intuitively understand that section of the course is consider two variables that you're trying to control. So you can, the analogy might be the position of two cars traveling along, along the road, side by side. And if those two variables are considered independent of each other, it means that there's no interaction between them. You can move each one and there's no effect on the other. So the position of those variables can be independently achieved. We'll say that variables, two variables have interaction if you can move them, but by moving one, you will affect the other one in some way. Okay? So the degree by which you affect the other one is a function of this interaction between them. And we say systems are weakly interacting or they're strongly interacting depending on the nature of of the system being, being um, controlled over there. And then finally, two systems are linearly dependent on each other when you have no ability to independently control. In other words, if you move the one variable, the other variable will automatically moves, move with it. Okay, there's no way that you can move them in any, any way apart from each other. So interaction is somewhere in between if you move one variable, the other will follow along to some extent, greater or lesser extent, in which we can determine using our transfer function. So we go back to all that transfer function derivation you did in 3P, and that we can use to determine the extent of interaction. So we won't consider independent variables because that would be the equivalent of just having one PID loop for this variable and another PID loop for this variable and there's no interaction between them. Okay, so that's an that's easy case. In fact, that's what most control loop design is that you've done so far. Is when you looked at your flow sheet for your course project, you, you design the, the loop pairing for one variable, design the loop pairing for the other, and there's no interaction. But let's take a look at an example. I'm oh, sorry, before we get to that, just, just a quick recap, actually, of the map behind, behind all of that. So recall when you did this derivation in, in 3P, you created this mathematical construct where you said, if I manipulate one variable, so you might have called this U1, depending if you took the course with Dr. Schwartz uh, and you, which textbook he was using. So U1 is the manipulated variable, and there's a gain on the first transfer function, and there's your Y1. Okay, so here's your your first transfer function, called the GP1, you give it an input U1, and there's a response Y1. 
into a second process you're trying to control with input U2 and output Y2. So they're as drawn as if they're independent processes. And the gain for this, the gain for this first process is called K11. So it's the gain or the amount by if I change U1 by a small step, K1 tells me what sorry, that final change is going to be in Y1. So if it's a positive gain, an upward step in U1 is going to be an upward response in Y1. Same for K22. K22 tells me what that change is in U1, U2, for, and then the response in Y2 might be a negative gain. So, so that response is going to be K22 times U2. So that change over there. So that's independent processes. Now, when you make this change in U1, it may have some effect actually on Y2 over here. So we don't, for a process where there's interaction, a change here in one of your variables, this might be a flow rate that you're using to control the temperature, this flow rate change might also change composition for you. Okay? It might weakly change it, but it does change it, and the amount by which it changes it is called K12. Sorry, K21. K21 is if you multiply your change in U1, manipulated variable 1, what is the effect on your second Y variable? So what we hope for is our off-diagonal elements are zero. If we've got independence between our variables, our off-diagonals are zero. Now, we, would, we don't need to go into all the detail again from 3P, but the key principle from 3P was that if this determinant was non-zero, then you can control these variables independently. Or, so you can control them. They may interact, but at least you can control them. Okay, whereas if that determinant is zero in that matrix, it's this situation. Where if you shift one <coughs> variable, the other variable moves automatically. So that's just a bit of a recap. Now, let's take a look at this example and think about it for a minute. I'm trying to control two variables, the flow and the composition of this mixed mixture. So two, two variables I wish to control. And I've got two manipulated variables. The flow rate of this first stream, which contains A, the flow rate of A, and there's a certain composition here of XA. The second stream that I'm blending it with is my solvent, for example. FS is the flow rate of that solvent stream. And the solvent stream happens to contain no species A. Species A is only present in the, in the first stream. Can you control the flow rate and that composition? Or if you change one, the other changes also. Just from an intuitive principle, can I achieve a change in the flow and in the composition? Sorry, can I control the flow of M and the composition of M in, in some way? to increase the flow rate of M, what would you do? Increase FM. You can open either valve. You can open either valve. What will happen to XAF? Depends which valve you open. Okay. So in that case, there will be some interaction. But can you find a valve combination that will only change FM and not change XAM? the same ratio to maintain the same composition? Yeah. Is that right? Or oh. so but but 
it is clear that if you increase this flow rate over here, Fm is going to increase. Will Xam change? Yeah, it will go up. If I open, if I leave this valve constant and I open this valve more, Fm is going to go up. But what's going to happen to Xam? Go down. Okay. So because you now blend, uh, reduce or diluting that flow. So there is an interaction between those two variables. But it's interesting that you can manipulate FM and XAM. There's some interaction between them, but it's the situation where it's sort of an analogy of a spring between the two cars. There's an interaction. We don't need to go through the, the um, mechanics here of the, the deviation form model and the Laplace transform, but it's essentially what you can show then is that the determinant of that matrix is non-zero. But even from an intuitive point of view, you can see that, yes, you can control FM, you can control XAM, but there's going to be some interaction between the two variables. So that's, this is an example of a system that's sort of connected by a spring. Very simple system, but show, uh, shows that principle quite nicely. Let's take a look at another, another situation. Um, here's, here's an example where you, you want to add flexibility to a process. So recall we said at the start of the class, flexibility is about being able to operate away from our base case and move around our operating window. So here's an example where our goal is to control, control this temperature leaving the heat exchanger. So we've got a cold stream A uh, heating up to some higher value and I want to maintain that at a certain point. So maintain that at, at a new value or at a given value. And I'm using another stream B to do that. Now, on the next slide, you're going to go ahead and I'll give you about three, four minutes to do this because you'll need a little bit more time, especially for option three. This one is a really important one to understand. Take a look at these three cases and say, what, what do I add to the system here in, in step one? if I want to control that temperature, but I have to keep the flow rate of stream A constant, I can vary B's flow rate, however. Then look at this situation where you have to keep the flow of A constant, however you can vary B's flow rate, add on the control loops for that, and then the final one is, what are you gonna do if you need to keep the flow rate of A and B constant? So A's flow rate cannot be changed, it's being expected downstream at a given flow rate, and B, is coming from another part of your process. This isn't like steam or some other hot, hot fluid. This is a given flow that cannot be altered. So how can you get this heat integration, get this, we like to do heat integration where we can to save money, but you've got this constraint that those flows are constant on stream A and D. So I'll give you a few minutes to work through that and try to figure out the controls or flexibility you're going to add to the flow sheet.
This is your number three. I figured out a way to do it. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Any suggestions on how to control that by keeping the stream A this flow rate constant? classic example of a utility so you use low pressure steam, medium pressure steam and so some utility stream moving there it's quite okay to throttle that flow rate up and down any suggestions for the second case? where it's quite okay to vary flow in stream A but not in, in B you do the same thing with the valve. Okay. Same thing with the valve. Over here. Uh, either way. Okay. Control the temperature again. So, like, so if you want to be warmer, you open or close the valve. Okay. The Should we locate the valve? Um, yeah, so we locate the valve here and measure the temperature there. So this is achieving that, that, that control of the temperature. Now, is this something that's normally done? We see. Would it work? And we normally see this in flow sheets. But it wouldn't. So this might be one of the first times you've seen this, but would this work? Maybe not. Because you can't control, like, it's really hard to control the, the stream A. Because you're going to get that from the process of the reaction. So you don't want to slow that down to affect the stream. Right, so you wouldn't want to normally, but our constraint is that this is constant. We have the, the ability that this is adjustable. So we're saying we don't mind that flow to vary. So let's say that we're allowed to vary this flow, but we're asking, like, physically, would this control would work? Yeah, it does work. Um, it's just not typically done, but it, it certainly will will work for for us um, in the same way that this will work. So same, you can derive the same set of equations and, and verify that. Okay, so you would, if this temperature over here is too low, you would s slow down the flow rates of the stream coming in. Any suggestions for the third option? A recycle stream on one of them. A recycle stream? So you're taking from where? The, let's say the top B, <coughs> the bottom B, and then if you want it to be hard, you recycle more. If you want A to be hard, Okay, so the suggestion is to take flow out of here, split it, and bring it back in to B. So 
sounds right. That would, uh, that would make the water cooler, not warmer, because you're passing through colder water. But I think the idea is the right time. So you would recycle, but I think stream A would be easier to recycle. So you take from here, bring it back. Okay, so you've got material flowing here. Now it splits and it gets basically another chance to be heated again. If hot enough, you would increase the recycle if you go and it's too hot. That's the only issue I'm having. I don't know how to do that. Would it not just stay out at some new value and not achieve the control? So it's an interesting suggestion. I have heard it before. So I was trying to think through it myself. I, I, I would suspect that eventually uh, if you recycle it will it will just steady out at some new value, but not necessarily control the temperature. Well, wouldn't that be like you control the recycle ratio? Control the recycle like ratio. The yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I don't know. I think I, I suspect that it may not actually achieve, but I'm probably going to have to simulate that to see. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. Didn't think of it. Um, any other suggestions? Yeah, Kevin. The bypass. The bypass, Alex. You say by the review exchange that you can't control. Okay, buy another heat exchange you can't control, okay. <laughs> so without spending capital, too much capital cost, is there something we can do is, is, is a suggestion that we can to bypass. How would you bypass, or where bypass from where to where? Uh, just like from both sides, like the hot stream go around the heat exchanger and the cold stream go around the heat exchanger, yeah. Okay, so either take the cold stream and send it bypass the heat exchanger or the hot stream around the heat exchanger. So either one works. Um, so you can add to your drawing a little bit more clearly drawn over here that if this temperature is too low over here, so we, in other words, we're not heating enough, do I open this valve or do I close this valve? Sorry. If TC is too low, you might want to close that over. Close the valve. Closing this valve means that I'm sending more material through the heat exchange. So this varies, doesn't change anything. The net flow of stream A and the net flow of stream B will be constant. So I haven't altered that flow. I'm able to achieve temperature control that way. So we'll, we'll see this um, in, in another example further down um, in the slides. But then the final one to consider here is, is it possible to control both the temperature at the outlet for stream A and B? for that and, and do the, the deviation form variables, uh, you can show the heat transfer requirements from the hot stream is Q hot, the heat transfer to the cold stream is Q cold, they need to be equal to each other. And if you go and do work through the calculations on that, uh, essentially you get one of these systems. The determinant for that system will be zero, indicating that you cannot control those two temperatures independently. Okay, so we can control one of them or the other, but you cannot achieve uh, independence or close to independent control of those two temperatures. So I'd like you to, uh, to go through some of the rest of the slides. There's just a few more examples in there on your own time. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea for what we add to a process to achieve <coughs> flexibility. And in the next class, we'll look at reliability. Uh, there was one question just quickly on the deliverables for Friday. Uh, posted on the website is, is the, the spreadsheet filled in. Okay, so I don't need documents and so forth, I just need the spreadsheet with the numbers. The documentation will go in your final report.